House of Ed Tech, Episode 49. Hi, this is Jill Dobronsky, Director of Curriculum and Instruction at Wall Township Public Schools, and you're listening to the House of Ed Tech with our superhero, Chris Nassie. Support for this episode of House of Ed Tech came from Audible.com. As a listener of this podcast, you are entitled to get two free audiobooks. There are over 180,000 titles to choose from, and you can play them on your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or other MP3 player. To take advantage of this offer, go to tinyurl.com slash H-O-E-T Audible. Welcome to the House of Ed Tech podcast. I am your host, Christopher Nessie, and the House of Ed Tech explores how technology is changing the way teachers teach and the impact that technology is having in education. We discuss technology that is changing our classrooms and schools. We share tips, tools, and resources that you can hear about today and use tomorrow. I talk to teachers, leaders, and creators like you and have them share their stories. Because whether you use it or not, technology is changing the way we teach and how our students learn. As we get right into this episode, I just want to take a moment to wish all of my North American listeners here in the U.S. a very happy Thanksgiving holiday as we get into the holiday season here in 2015. Coming up in this episode, I have my EdTech thought, EdTech recommendation, a great interview with Lavana Roth, and of course, the House of EdTech VIP. Now, I need to be a little transparent, pull back the curtain here on what I do, and I, I need to apologize. I need to apologize to Adam Schoenbart and AJ Bianco, because this episode was originally recorded live at EdCamp, New Jersey. Trying to do something different, I did not do it right. I attempted to record myself on my MacBook, and I was recording, or I thought I was recording, AJ and Adam on my iPad using the app Boss Jock Pro, which is a phenomenal app, but this was the first time I was doing this live mobile podcasting setup. So I learned a couple of lessons and I've also determined that there are a couple of pieces of hardware that I do need to get if I want to be able to do this successfully in the future and be able to create content at this level um, for the show. So my apologies to you and also to Adam and AJ because we had put together something that was really cool and having somebody co-host the show was a totally different dynamic that I welcomed. And uh, those guys were really on board and they brought a lot of energy. So it is going to be something that I look to do again successfully in the future. Now, with that being said, I was at Ed Camp, New Jersey, uh, as I record this today on November 21st, 2015. And I was able to earlier in the day, get some audio And I was asking people in sessions and in the hallways, you know, what did they learn? What did they find valuable? And one question that I asked everybody who I got the opportunity to speak with was, what is the value that you find in EdCamp and what makes it valuable to you? So if you listen to this podcast and you have not yet ever attended an EdCamp, and that could be for any number of reasons, maybe you don't have the time to to give up on a Saturday or whenever an EdCamp in your area is. Or perhaps you're in an area where ed camps just aren't happening. So maybe you can learn from these people here in this episode, connect with them, learn more about what an ed camp is, and potentially start your own ed camp. So I'm looking forward to sharing that information and people's views with you. Before we get into the rest of the episode, I do want to take a moment to remind you again that the 2015 House of Ed Tech App Smackdown is coming. And you need to get your submissions into me by November 30th, 2015. Now, your submission first can't be a repeat from anything that was in last year's episode number 26. And it really shouldn't be anything that I've already recommended in any of the episodes of the podcast. So while that can be challenging, I still want to know a favorite app, something cool that can be shared with the whole House of EdTech community. 
So you can get me that audio. And again, I would prefer to have you submit audio. You can do that by calling the House of EdTech feedback line. And that number, as always, is 732-903-4869. Or you can send me a message on Voxer. My username is Mr. Nessie. Or you can go to chrisnessie.com and you can click on the SpeakPipe button over on the right-hand side of the webpage. Or if you go to the blog post that I posted about this year's App Smackdown, I, I embedded SpeakPipe right in the post. And you can click and leave a message right from your computer, right in your browser. And it should be, you know, one to two minutes in length and tell me who you are, what the tool is, why it's awesome, where people can find it. And I'm assembling episode number 51 to be released as my last episode here in 2015. So get me those submissions by November 30th, and it's going to be awesome. Looking forward to sharing that content again. And now let's get into some of the meat and potatoes and let's get over to the EdTech Thought. My EdTech Thought for this episode is called The Value of EdCamp. And I'd like to share with you some of the audio clips that I was able to pick up at EdCamp, New Jersey. So let's get right into it. All right. This continues... House of EdTech live at EdCamp, New Jersey, and I am now here in the gym, the auxiliary gym, at Jonathan Dayton High School here in Springfield, New Jersey, and I am joined by the awesome maker queen, Meredith Martin, at Geeky Teach on Twitter. How are you, Meredith? I am fantastic, especially being called a queen. That's wonderful. You're too kind. <laughs> I try, and it's well-deserved. Meredith, what is the value of having a makerspace at an EdCamp? Many teachers have been hearing about the uh, the maker movement, the STEM movement, the hands-on, the, the problem and project-based learning movement, but they have no idea how to get started. And many times they have the misconception that it's either A, very complicated, B, very expensive, or C, both. And the makerspace that we have here today is a way to show them that it doesn't have to be any of those things. A lot of what we have here is what I call dollar store STEM. It's materials either from the dollar store or recyclable materials like cardboard tubes and cans and bottles and things like that. And we put them together in different ways with different activities, most of which can be linked to the next-gen state standards and the Common Core state standards. And we show teachers simple and easy ways that will not break the bank because we all know how tight money is in school districts. Oh yes, our resources are very valuable. Now, you and Billy Krakauer were at stores just last night shopping to put together some of the activities that are here today. What are just give us some examples of some of these dollar store stem items that you picked up? Oh, I, I love the dollar store. Um, one of my favorite activities both for myself and for people who come is the marshmallow catapult, which is a great activity. And all you really need are rubber bands, popsicle sticks or craft sticks, depending on what you call them, uh, plastic spoons, and a marshmallow or other small item that you can launch with. And it's a lot of fun. The kids have a great time making them. The adults have even more fun. I have fond memories of a pack of administrators at a makerspace I did trying to launch marshmallows on top of the light fixtures in the library I was in because administrators are the biggest kids of all. Um, but the kids love it, and as a teacher, I can pull in a lot of different um, educational things with that. We talk about angles. We talk about force and motion and velocity. It's also a way, okay, we make a sample one together, and they follow along and make my model. And then we talk about, well, how can we modify this? Let's do some problem solving. What if we want it to go further? What if we want it to go higher? How can we change this and make it better? What worked? What didn't work? And it's a great way for the kids to kind of think outside the box instead of just doing a step-by-step -step activity. We do that first, but now that you have the general idea, what else can you do with it? Well, let's take it further. Let's find a problem and figure out a way to solve it. So we pull in a lot of that critical thinking and the thinking outside the box with this. Thank you so much for a few minutes, Meredith. Where can people connect with you outside of New Jersey who want to learn more about what you do and learn from you? Um, best place to get a hold of me is on Twitter, at GeekyTeach. And you can also check out a lot of my activities, projects, photos, resources 
on my website, techforteachers.com. All right, and I'm back here again at EdCamp, New Jersey, and I am standing here with Miss Tina Monteleone. She's a North Jersey teacher, and she's about to present. So I'm distracting the session right now, live, sort of. Tina, what are you going to present on? I'm presenting on tech and the struggling student. What's the biggest tool you're going to recommend today? The biggest tool, I think, is sort of creating a framework. In other words, for um, what kind of tech toolbox we all have to have when we walk into any room because our struggling students are not just ones with IEPs. Uh, they're the ELL students, they're the ones that are falling below grade level. So we have to be prepared to walk into a classroom and, and have a set of tools for them at any given time. Can you recommend one tool for me right now? I think one of the biggest things that I have used this year uh, is coming out of Text Help is their toolbar, ReadWorks. Uh, some people know it as that. Um, it is free. Part of the toolbar is free um, for students. Uh, educators get the whole toolbar for free. It's got text to speech, speech to text, uh, highlighting component, uh, but it's a really fantastic tool. And before I let you go, what is your favorite part of EdCamp? The learning and the sharing part. I mean, I just love sitting in a classroom and just the takeaways are amazing. You come out of here so inspired and ready for Monday. And for people that want to connect with you, what's the best way that they can do that? On Twitter, of course, at Tina Monte. T I N A M O N T E. Thank you, Tina. Enjoy your session. Thanks, Chris. So I'm here with Sharon Nagy Johnson. She's the director of technology for Springfield Public Schools here at uh, Jonathan Dayton High School. And Sharon, what I want to know is, from your perspective, because you've been doing EdCamp for a number of years, what is the best part and the most valuable thing about EdCamps? The most valuable thing about Ed Camps are the attendees. Everyone here that comes together to make this event happen is by far, hands down, um, the most valuable part. Uh, each other, you know, uh, each and every one of the attendees that uh, communicates with another person, that shares a piece of information, um, networks, uh, c keeps the relationships ongoing after today. Uh, all make Ed Camp a valuable experience. Over those years, what's the most valuable thing that you've learned as somebody who works in education? I would have to say the most valuable thing I've learned is that there's always someone that you can find and go to uh, for more information. Uh, networking is extremely critical because it's through other people that you help, uh, that you, you, you receive the help to make the connections that you need when you're searching for uh, something, um, especially information. You make, you make that great point. What are some ways that people can get in touch with you and pick your brain? Uh, well, you can get in touch with me any way you want. You can call me on my cell phone. You can email me. Uh, you can uh, tweet at TechSoup, S-U-P-V. Um, you can... Uh, any way you want to contact me, you can contact me. Feel free. Pass by. Give me a call. Thank you so much, Sharon. All right, and the party continues here at Ed Camp, New Jersey. I am here. <laughs> I am here with AJ Bianco, Batman from the Ed Justice League, and AJ. You were in a session earlier today about Breakout Edu. I know that excited you. But what is Breakout EDU? So Breakout EDU is kind of the way I look at it is a scavenger hunt where you have this box and inside the box is the final, I guess, the final hint to your puzzle. And as teams, you walk around the room and you look for clues and you try to find how to get inside this box. There's two, three, four different locks and your clues can be anywhere inside the room, under desks, on the walls. Uh, they did a great job at the Breakout EDU session where they had... Um, a black light basically and they had written something on a piece of paper and without that black light you would never have known what was there so it was a hidden clue it was fantastic now in finding these clues and finding out what's in the box what are you learning what is the purpose the purpose is and the way I look at it first of all it builds teamwork and collaboration and working together but it could be content related they had so many if you go to breakoutedu.com there are so many different boxes available for your content, whether it's English, science, math, social studies especially, uh, you can be learning content while you're working as a team. Is this something you have ever used in the classroom or would like to use in the classroom? 
never used it, heard about it before, was interested, and wasn't sure what it was. It is something I would definitely look into using now. But there is a cost to it, so make sure you can cover the cost in some way, whether it's a grant or if it's going to come out of your pocket. It's not really expensive, but it's something that you should try, and I'm going to absolutely try. Very cool, and thank you for a couple of minutes. And before I let you go, in your opinion, what is the most valuable part about an ed camp? Most valuable part about the ed camp is collaborating and connecting with people who you don't see on a regular basis, but you speak to every day. Thank you, AJ. And where can people connect with you? You can find me on Twitter at AJ Bianco. That's AJ B I A N C O. And you can check out my blog, uh, same name, AJ Bianco.me. Thank you very much, pal. All right, I am here in the Google Expeditions EdCamp session here at EdCamp New Jersey. And I'm here with my friend Nikki Singer at Singer Teach on Twitter. And she'll repeat that in a couple of minutes. Uh, Nikki? Talk about what you just learned about Google Expeditions. So Google Expeditions is a wonderful new initiative uh, run through Google where students and Google will come to the school district if the school district signs up and is selected. And students will receive a viewfinder, which is made of cardboard and a smartphone. And they're taken on tours that um, the teacher has pre-selected. So they're actually coming to our school on Tuesday. And my students are going on a London literary tour to learn about the Globe Theater and about Shakespeare before we start our unit, learning Star Wars through Shakespeare. That's very cool. Now, since we are at EdCamp, and I've seen you at a couple of these unconference events, what is your favorite part about EdCamp and unconferences? Well, I think the big part is the passion of everyone being at the ed camp and giving up their Saturday for something and also the flexibility of being able to not have the formalized presentations and being able to get up and move out of your seat and switch presentations to find out things that you're passionate about and have that choice. And get to be interviewed on a podcast is also fun. Woohoo! <laughs> now where can people connect with you to learn more and pick your brain about the things you're doing in your classrooms? Okay, so you can follow my classroom at hashtag singer class, and you can follow me at singer teach on Twitter, and you can also check out our amazing school, which is John Adams Middle School in Edison at hashtag jamazing. Thank you, Nikki Singer. I appreciate your time. No problem. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, my live from Ed Camp, New Jersey continues. We just finished lunch, and I'm here with somebody who just introduced themselves to me as a fan of the House of Ed Tech. So I'm standing here with Teresa Palumbo from Newark Public Schools. She teaches literacy, and we were just talking about some technology, so I quickly went and grabbed the mic, and now welcome to the House of Ed Tech, Teresa. Oh, thank you, Mr. Nessie. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I am a 7th and 8th grade literacy teacher for Park Elementary, House of the Panthers. Go Panthers. Um, and my role in the school is to push into classrooms to help teachers start to implement it, um, implement technology. However, my math teachers are very hesitant. So I was looking for some interesting math um, add-ons or applications that we can use on our Chromebooks. Um, we do have Chromebooks very frequently in our classrooms. So if anybody can reach out to me, I am at uh, on Twitter, Miss underscore Palumbo, P-A-L-U-M-B-O. I would really appreciate it. And um, I look forward to learning more from Mr. Nessie. What are some of your favorite tech tools that you use in literacy in general? Uh, some of my favorite tools currently, we are big on the Google Read and Write toolbar. It has become one of my go-tos for not just struggling students, but even my higher level students really like it and benefit from it. Um, in addition, we do a lot with Storybird, and the kids really jump right into it. Um, they can write poetry, they can write long-form stories, they can write picture books, and the great thing about that is then they can download them and publish them, which the kids are really into. Um, some of the other things that I like to do is um, we've been experimenting with collaborative documents in Google Docs. Uh, the first time we did it, it was a, a little messy. There were lots of, ah, and oohs and ahs, and stop typing in my box, and all of this. Um, but we debriefed at the end, and we decided that because... When too many people get on the on our shared document, we decided that we were going to break it up a little bit more and maybe limit the number of groups so it, it kind of functions a little bit better. Um, in addition, we're teaching the kids how to do some screencasting through our tech team and uh, just a whole bunch of stuff. We're, we're using Google Classroom all the time. It's just I love the digital world, and I can't wait to uh, really branch out into digital education. 
That is fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing a couple of tools. Um, and since I, again, since I have you here, I am going to personally task you to submit something for the 2015 House of EdTech App Smackdown, which you can go to chrisnessy.com, click on the speak pipe button, or you can call the House of EdTech hotline, and that number will come at the end of this episode. So where, again, can people connect with you? Uh, people can connect with me um, at tpalumbo at nps.k12.nj.us or uh, more easily on Twitter at Miss underscore Palumbo, P-A-L-U-M-B-O. Thank you so much, Teresa. Thank you to everybody who took time out of their day to contribute to these, you know, man on the street type interviews. I really appreciate it. Everybody's username for Twitter and how you can connect with all those great individuals is going to be in the show notes for this episode over on chrisnessy.com and just look for the show notes for this episode number 49. And that's my ed tech thought. And now for this episode's ed tech recommendation, I'd like to share with you an awesome website called appear.in, A-P-E-A-R dot I-N. Learning how to communicate is one of the core things that we learn in school. Whether it's reading words written by others, writing our own opinions, presenting our work, or collaborating in a group, students develop their communication skills every day in our classes. With new technology, the way we communicate also changes. Appear.in lets you communicate in the most natural way, seeing the person you're talking to, hearing their voice, and taking in all their body language. Here are six ways that you can use appear.in in the classroom according to appear.in, and these are six really cool things. Number one, talking to students in another country in language class. How cool would that be to be teaching Spanish or French and connect your class using this platform with another class in another country? Number two, playing Kahoot. Play the quizzes with other classes in your school, in your district or across the country and across the world. Kahoot, as you know, is a phenomenal tool. So here's a way that you can app smash and use something like appear.in and Kahoot together. Number three, allowing students to call into class when they're not able to get to school. Maybe they're sick. Maybe they couldn't get to school. For whatever reason, you have kids that aren't in class. This might be a great way to get the kids to learn in a virtual way. Number four, tutoring students when they're home. This could be a great platform for home instruction students and not have to go to a kid's house to do the tutoring when they're out, whether, you know, when they're sick or whatever is keeping them from coming to school physically. Use this platform because you can screen share. So you could share a PowerPoint, you could share Google slides, you could share your screen, you could demonstrate stuff and the student would be able to kind of interact with you. It's a really awesome platform. Number five, meeting with students and students' parents. We don't always have the availability, you know, after school or before school, but maybe on prep or at some point during the day, or maybe the parent's schedule doesn't allow them to come in at traditional times. This is a secure platform where you can video conference. You could take advantage of it. Again, screen sharing, text chat. You can interact with people. Number six, communicating with students during group tasks or projects where students work in different rooms around the school. It's a great way to be an eye in the sky or have your kids interact with each other around the school. Appear.in is web-based and there is also a mobile app and you have the ability to also, you know, lock down uh, a domain name. So you can have like appear.in slash your class or your name and you can then have ownership of that classroom or that appear.in space. So that's really cool. And of course, appear.in is free. And I recommend that you check it out. And that's my House of Ed Tech recommendation. I had the distinct honor of meeting Lavana Roth and learning from her at the 2015 NJPA ESET 2 conference. Lavana is an internationally known author, keynote speaker, and an education consultant. 
Her passion is bridging neuroscience and education. She has worked with over 25,000 educators, students, and organizations which have benefited from her down-to-earth strategies and insights to the most common and frustrating educational and behavioral issues. She's an educator with 10 years of experience, and Lavana has been recognized at both the local and state levels for her teaching successes. She's based out of Tampa Bay, Florida. She is truly committed to bettering others so they can better themselves. I am very proud and honored to speak to Lavana Roth here live at Ed Camp, New Jersey. Lavana, welcome to the House of Ed Tech. Thank you so much, Chris. It's an honor to be here, and thank you so much. We were going to do this interview earlier in the week, but you are a very busy person. So, I again, I, I said it before we started, and I just have to make sure it's documented. I really appreciate you taking the time. Now, for meeting you at the Alphabet Conference, as I call it, back in, uh, <laughs> back in was it October, September? One of your big initiatives right now is Shine, S-H-I-N-E, and we're going to talk all about that. But this is the House of Ed Tech, so I do need to talk about some, some tech-related stuff. So you're very big in engaging students, and one of the things that you like to do is sometimes you have tech, sometimes you don't have a lot of it, and sometimes there's an overabundance of technology. So talk a little bit about how you engage students when there is no tech, low tech, or when there's too much, we call it high tech. So when it comes to technology, you know, I always approach things with, from the perspective of how does the brain learn. And so in doing so, technology is one of those that it hasn't been around long enough for us to really see like the long-term effects. So there are some things going on in the back of the brain, our um, cortex, you know, towards the back there. And it's one of those occipital lobes where we're seeing neurons that are thickening. And is it because of such a visual stimulation that we have? But again, the, the thing with that is that we don't quite know because you know, haven't had studies that have been done long enough as well, you know, as enough, large enough groups. And so it's one of those that yet, yet to be seen. But my belief is that everything comes back to moderation. So I think it's important for kids to be up moving. And so when they have high tech and that's all we're doing is doing high technology or we have teachers who may hand it to them and say, okay, that's all I have to do, go run run with it for 40 minutes, 50 minutes, whatever it may be. Kids aren't getting a chance to get up and moving. They're not interacting, getting social skills. So I think everything comes back to that moderation. At the same time, technology is very engaging, and it does things that we aren't able to do even as educators. You know, for them to get on an app or some kind of a program that can then completely differentiate based upon their needs at that moment, that's very powerful. You know, we have one teacher among, what, 20 kids, 24 kids at different times, and maybe some of them are lucky enough to have 18. But for most educators, it's a challenge to differentiate and meet the needs of every kid, and technology allows us to do that. So by my mind, I feel it's important to have, you know, whether it's – no technology, and that's where my strategies come in. So, for example, we do one that's it's the most popular one, and you take a word web. And I remember looking at a word web and thinking, well, the brain thinks in patterns and organization. So that would be a graphic organizer or a thinking map. So how do I get that off that page, though, to let it be interactive, let it be movement? And so I, the idea came to me, and I call it crazy, really creative here, kinesthetic word web. Okay, not, it's not so creative, <laughs> but the kinesthetic word web. And what we do is we take what would typically on a, be on a word web with a main idea or topic in the middle and the things related to it going around it. We pop those off and put each individual one on index cards. And so the first time you know we do this, it's all modeling, the teacher's modeling, but the goal is for the students to actually create the webs and then put them on the index cards themselves. And it could be illustrations, it could be non-examples, which is one of the things we kick. And there's a lot of ways to kick this up even higher. But now every kid gets an index card, they stand up and they go around the room and they have to figure out, who do I relate to as a web? They create that group, who's the main idea or topic, put them in the middle. And it could even be a solution to a math problem. Again, a lot of ways we could do this. But they get the opportunity to then socialize. And then my whole point is I come over as the teacher, and this is what I teach teachers to do. So we're going to ask them, okay, so, for example, you have plants. And you see that it has the roots, the leaves, and you know, the four parts of a plant. What would happen if we remove the leaves from a plant? And I leave them to go talk to another group, and when I come back, I have to have, I ask them, okay, so what was your decision? You know, what did you think? Or sometimes I'll disagree with them and say, you know, I don't think plants is the main idea or topic. I really think that, you know what, I think it's actually stem. Because the leaves come off the stem, the roots come off a stem, flower comes off of a stem, and it's part of a plant. And if we put plants in the middle, not every plant has a flower. So I'm going to be back, and I want two reasons why you agree with me or two reasons why you disagree with me. So it's all about challenging kids and getting them to think at a higher level. So t- as when it comes to technology, I think there's moments for it where you want to have high technology, and there's times where we need to pull back and let kids learn to be- move and socialize. With the scenario you just described, it starts out with something that would be considered low-tech on index cards. What are some tools that you've used to take some of these activities to that maybe average tech or even you take it and you're really integrating technology into some of your strategies. 
So a lot of it has to do with when people have interactive whiteboards or smart boards. I've seen teachers create, and I don't know the specific apps that they that they use, but they'll use the smart board and they'll put the different components off to the side, and then students are dragging and dropping and creating an entire web from that. I've also seen them take iPads. <laughs> this is also just this is why I love working with teachers is they took iPads and the iPad became its own index card. So pulling up a simple. That's cool. Like document, right. And, so, and that that became the index cards, and now we're going paperless with it. And they walked around. They could change anything. They could add things to it. They traded iPads to redo the web to get an opportunity to do the web again. And so there's been a, a variety of things. But I, I'm sure I would love to hear more ideas from people. How are you integrating that technology to kick it up a notch so that we do have a great moderation? Part of what you do also revolves around you do a lot of traveling. What are some of the tools that you use that make your life as an educator, because you've been an educator with you know over a decade of experience, um, what are some of the tools that you use that make you a better teacher? Yeah, I'm still working on the getting the whole organized and figuring things out. <laughs> <laughs> so thankfully, I have someone who helps me with a lot of that. Um, but you know what's really helped a lot is me getting on Google. And I have to tell you, I resisted Google for a very long time. Yes, I didn't quite see the benefit and what I was doing before was fine. And then I started it. With the person who helps me, she said, you know what, why don't you go into Google Drive? And that just sounded massive to me, and I was like, no, no, no. And what do you mean Google Docs? And what do you mean, like, I just got very overwhelmed with the dashboard and all that, and I'm now getting to the point more comfortable, and I'm thinking, what in the world was I thinking? Like, why not, you know? So Google Calendar I use. I also use iCal, so it's kind of a bridge there. But um, the Google Drive has just really helped me be able to share, and even you know educators who say, "Hey, you talked about this. Do you have a resource for it or checklist for it?" And I'm able to share it so much easier than before. When I'm traveling, I whew, thoughts come, brainstorms come. You just as an educator, you know, in some of the things teachers need to know is that when you have those brainstorms, we often think, "Oh, I'll remember this," and then ten minutes down the We're road, our no, there's too many of the thousand other things on your head, you know, in your mind to be able to think, "Okay, how do I possibly remember this?" So even simple things, I, I tend to be a Mac girl. You know, I have a lot of all Apple products. But using the reminders to remind me of certain things, and a lot of times they get changed to a different day or a different time. Um, but it really helps keep me to not forget certain things. And then notes. I use notes a lot when I go, okay, wait, what was my idea on that? Or what was I thinking? Or, you know, reminder again, a teacher needs something from me. I can use reminders. So those are the main core ones that I tend to use. But I, I can't believe I resisted Google for as long as I did. Now, do you go so far as to, as, are you like, do you use Siri to set the reminders? Are you like really into like your iPhone and everything? Yeah, I'm, I'm really trying to stick to a calendar, you know. So it, it's gotten to the point that I actually schedule my family in. And that's something I resisted for a very long time as well because I, when first it was recommended to me, I actually got offended because I thought, wait, how do I possibly schedule my family? Like, they're the priority. Like, if we want to go do something, we go do it. And then it clicked one day. It made sense to me because I overheard um, Kevin Harrington. He's one of the original sharks from Shark Tank. And I was at an event where he was speaking, and he made the comment of how he scheduled his family. And the person who recommended it to me turned to me, and she gave me this look. And I went, okay. But he did a shift for me because what ended up happening is, you know, we get so caught up as educators. We have such a passion and such a love for kids and how do we make ourselves better and how do we help other teachers and our colleagues. And we get so trapped and stuck into that that sometimes we forget about other priorities. So what I realized is that when I scheduled my family, when I was working, I had, to go, I had the thought of, you know what, it's not a big deal that I'm not with my family right now because I have the time scheduled with them. And when I'm with my family, I wasn't thinking about what all I needed to do to help educators because that was family time. And I knew that I had both blocked out, so it wasn't like I was dropping the ball on one or the other. It actually allows me time for both. I am guilty of the same thing. My wife, she makes me put everything on a calendar, and I still resist. Um, but I'm trying to make my, you know, my life happy, so I'm getting better at putting stuff on the calendar so, so I can relate. <laughs> the other big thing that you are doing right now is Ignite Your Shine. And I spell that out, S-H-I-N-E, because it is an acronym. And I would like you to share this initiative and how wonderful it is and explain it. Let's talk about Shine. Chris, I am beyond excited about this. The, the Shine is where my passion and I feel that truly my calling is. As a teacher, I got really frustrated with looking at some of my students who had already given up, especially at the middle school level. And they felt that they were dumb. They felt they were stupid. And then when I taught elementary, I started hearing things even from my second graders, my fifth graders. And I thought, what in the world? And I realized that a lot of these kids felt they weren't smart. And so this caught my attention quite a bit. And then, you know, when I looked at even the gifted and talented program, you know, if you think to yourself, and what really hit me was my sister one day, and she's 
in her 30s, sitting across from the kitchen table not too long ago. And I asked her a question because she was in the Gift and Talented program. And I asked her a question, and she got very defensive. And I said, can I ask you, why, are, why were you defensive about what I just asked you? And she, I said, because it's okay if you don't know the answer. And she said, and she literally didn't say anything because she welled up with tears. And I said, okay, what's going on? And she said, well, I was always in the Gifted and Talented program. And I said, did you always feel like you had to have the answer? She's like, oh, yeah. It was, Kat was the smart one. She's the smart one. And if a teacher called on me, I had to have the answer because I was labeled the smart one. And then I thought about the opposite side of a lot of my students are like, well, I'm dumb. I'm not in the Gifted and Talented program. And what I realized is I think we approach this completely wrong. Like, you know, it's important to give kids and to learn to be strong in who they are. And that they are going to have weaknesses. But at the same time, every kid in my mind is gifted and talented. And that's my term is, is for it is shine. So I feel our job is it's three Fs. We are, our job as educators is to find, foster, and flourish. What are those gifts, skills, and talents that a child has? And if we don't, I feel that we failed them. So how do we take what that is and marry what they are phenomenal at, what they're amazing at to build that confidence and also marry that with what they have to leave our school system with? What are those specific skills with reading and math? And just because you're not great at math doesn't mean you're not going to be a success. You know, so I look at even some of our, I'm going to get a little in depth here, but I look at some of our, for example, calculus, algebra two. I have never, ever used any of that. You know, and I'm saying I wouldn't, but I think we put kids into so many classes that why are they in that class? Basic things and things they're going to use in life every day, yes. But I believe that if it's something that they need to know, they will learn it eventually. You know, and, it's, and so in the meantime, why can't we take their passion and what they're excited about? So Ignite Your Shine is all about the finding those gifts and talents. It's amazing. I'm so excited because there's such a movement going with it that I couldn't even see coming. I just wanted to jump in real quick and say that what you're doing with Shine, before we get to the acronym, is it really jives to, I can't even date myself because I wasn't alive in the 70s, but it jives with something that I've been promoting over the last year or so, which is that everybody has a voice and could be podcasting, should be creating content instead of maybe just relying on curating other people's, but that we're all experts in something, you know, whether it's making and people who, are, who know me, whether it's making duct tape wallets or something, you, you have skills, you have talent. And you should be sharing those with the world because we all look at the world in a different, unique way. You know, I don't look at it the same way you do. You don't look at it the same way that I do. So I'm on board. So let's go more. What does SHINE stand for? Okay, I just want to say to your point, that's the ultimate goal is I want our kids leaving feeling confident and knowing how they contribute to the world. Okay, so how do they shine? So Ignite Your Shine, the S in SHINE stands for self. And self is all about strengths, your talents, your gifts. And so there's going to be a double side to both of what I say here. So we've been talking about students, but I'm also going to say teacher to teacher, colleague to colleague, peer to peer. People to people. People to people, exactly. So the way I think about it is self, and we're going to focus it from the student view, but all of you educators listening and anyone listening, I would just want you to, to understand that this is really about anybody. So with kids, you know, what are their skills, strengths, and talents? And then I, I believe we should teach them that you have your strengths, skills, and talents, but how do you use that to serve yourself? Okay, wait, 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 hold on. Did I just say serve yourself? Yes, I did. Well, I gave a graduation commencement speech back in June to an alternative high school, and there were 55 students, the largest class ever, as in there were two students with a high school diploma the two years before. There were 18, and this year they're 55. And that's one of the things I said. I'm going to tell you something that a lot of people don't tell you, but I don't tell you to be to serve yourself to be greedy or selfish. I tell you to serve yourself because oftentimes we get caught up into a passion where we forget about ourselves and we do so much for others that we forget to take care of ourselves. And I see this across the board, across the United States, internationally even, where educators are running themselves down because they're so into serving others that they're getting burnout or health issues. So you serve yourself so you can take serve others. And that's a both side. Everything is about self and others. The H is what is your heart and what is your passion. All right, so if you think, okay, this is what I'm phenomenal at, over here is where my passion is. And I don't care. I, I worked with a bunch of fifth graders a couple weeks ago, and their, their passion was video games. That's fine. You know, okay, that's your passion right now. doesn't mean it won't change, doesn't mean, but let's talk about what that is right now. So now that you know your strength, your talent, your gifts, whatever it may be, and you marry that with your heart and your passion, you have a powerful package. So now you get to the I, and the I is inspire. So how do you inspire others and how do you inspire yourself every single day? Because, you know, there's those mornings you wake up and you're trying to have that growth mindset. But instead, you're sitting here going, OK, what about what? I don't know. I don't know. But then I'd say I don't feel very good and I'm not sure. And instead, have that growth mindset. And so how do you inspire when you cut to pitfalls or when it comes to students and someone says you suck, you know, or you're dumb, you're stupid. 
right? All the things, the negative things they say to each other, how do you learn to overcome that? So you have to learn to inspire yourself and you have to learn to inspire others and so strategies that get you through that. And then you get to the end and the end is navigate. And so you have yourself, you know, you have the heart and the passion, you ha- you're going to inspire, but what are you going to do with that? The end is navigate. That's that path, those goals, those steps that you're going to do. What is your journey going to be and, what's, and what is your action plan for it? And then in the end, it's the E, and the E is if you follow the self, the heart, the inspire, the, and the navigate, in the end, you are the exceptional you that you were meant to be. Not anybody else. You were you. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's that powerful, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I mean, I, I, I was introduced to it at, at NJ, at, at the alphabet. And it's just it, it's too many letters. Um, so to have this, again, to have this one-on-one opportunity with you, and, and it's just, I, I'm inspired. And based on what I do during the day, this way of thinking and this way of trying to bring out the best in students, this is something that what I normally promote with technology, you know, hear about it today and use it tomorrow. I, I can take this and anybody can take this and instantly implement this way of thinking and begin whatever grade level to bring out the best in your students. You can use this, obviously, with your colleagues. You can use this with your own children, your family. It, it, it's that powerful. So now here's the, the fastball question. No more softballs. Where did this come from? Wow, you're going to get to the heart of the matter. Um, you know, a lot of things that are missions that we, we get put on has to do with ourselves and our own story. And as so I mentioned, partly with my students was part of it and watching some of them feel defeated. And I got very drawn to kids who struggled or who felt very, very low on themselves and confidence and maybe didn't have the backing at home or among peers and such. But it goes a lot deeper than that. And I recently just started sharing my story. And I won't get into a whole lot of it today. But bottom line is I had... Um, when I, was, when I was born, I was put into an incubator, and there's a story. So the story goes that my grandmother looked through the window at the incubator and saw this little girl, and then walked her father, and she turned to her father, my dad, and said, if you want to be a part of her life, stay. If you don't, there's the door. And he chose to walk out the door. So for years, I felt I wasn't good enough. I felt that I had a lot to prove. I was a people pleaser. Um, very, I saw very raw feelings. I'm fighting tears right now. Um, you know, it's just uh, you, the, people don't always realize the impact of what they make. And what I re- realized until I was about 38 years old, I didn't have confidence. And I didn't feel smart. And by the time I got to middle school and high school, my grades were declining. As I told the high school graduation class, I wasn't all A student in high school. I wasn't all AB. I wasn't even all ABC. And I felt dumb. And I, here I am trying to prove myself to someone who left my life. And why am I trying to, I kept saying, well, you know what, I got this and I achieved this and this and that, but school was not my forte. And I recently got connected with a teacher from high school through Facebook (laughs) and she sent me a message and she said, you know, Lavana, what I remember about you is your smile and your enthusiasm. You were always willing to try new things. And I said to her, you know, I know I wasn't the smartest kid and she skipped that question. She's a smart teacher, right? But I also don't define myself as being unsuccessful at this point. I think I have found my way in the world and that's what Ignite Your Shine is all about is finding where do you fit? How do you contribute to make this world a better place? What is your role? And our job is to get kids to realize that and not feel that they're a failure in school so that we lose them in the end. And I'll tell you another little quick story that I just, I loved. Um, I asked a customer to send me a picture. So there's a gentleman that is in prison and he hand drew her nephew's picture and it is the most brilliant picture I've ever seen drawn like it's just amazing I'm drooling because like I can't draw with anything well the gentleman is in prison and the interesting thing about his story is that he didn't know he could draw or liked drawing until he was in prison and that's a kid to me that why didn't we not find and honor his what he could do and use that when we teach because wow what his life had been on a different path I'm not saying it would have but would it have possibly been on a different path if we had recognized that and figured out a way to make him be confident and to use that in a way that would just rock this world? I'm actually speechless. So powerful, Lavana. I, I, you, you have brought the host to, to, to silence. <laughs> um, I, I am honored that you that you shared that with me. Um, to, to hear that and and from what little I, I've known you only a short time in person. 
Um, you're amazing. <laughs> um, you are. It, is that a word? Shinetastic? Is that that's the official? Hashtag shinetastic. Okay. Hashtag ignite your shine. It, spelled out or you are? Okay. All right. I appreciate the and all, all the English teachers will appreciate that. Um, thank you so much for sharing everything. Uh, I, I think people will come away from this episode and, and your what you've shared feeling inspired. And I think that's what you want. I'm going to jump in, Chris. And just, you know, what I want everybody to realize is how valuable they are. There's a reason you were put into this world. And so five years ago, I was in a major car accident that highway patrol thought nobody survived. And I remember eventually later thinking, wait a minute, there's a reason I'm still here because I should not have been. And that's what I want everyone to realize is that there's a reason you're here. And you may not have discovered it. You may have discovered it. But what are you doing with that to either find that or to take what you already have and just ignite it, blow it out of the water, annihilate the box, annihilate everything and just become you and be proud of who you are. And I, when I was, I mentioned working with a fifth grade class and what was so cool is at the end, we asked some of the kids to share it. And one little girl stood up and she said, you know, and I'm so upset because you know how you hit video and you think you're recording? No, I hit stop. Thought I was recording and I wasn't. Um, but she stood up and she said, you know, when I come to school, I learned today that I can be myself. And I could have just stopped right there. That was, boom, a fifth grader to feel that she doesn't have to be anybody else anymore. She can be just her and comfortable. And that's what I want everyone to walk away with. You are you for a reason. It's incredible. So when you're working with a colleague that may drive you crazy and you want to strangle her neck right at times, think, okay, but wait, how do they shine? What's incredible about them that I can make sure that I help them and recognize them in that way? And what about myself and what about others? And I just really hope that... You know, people take away from this is how do I shine and how do other people shine? And my job is to help others shine. And that's why I actually um, have an Ignite Your Shine bracelet. And it's in the it's a bicycle spoke that's shaped into, you know, the shape of a light bulb. And then it wraps around the base where the light bulb goes around. It wraps around the base five times, one for each letter of shine. And I tell people, you know, those of you that get it, have it face away from you when, in moments where you are helping others shine. But when there's that day where you're having trouble yourself and just really struggling, turn the bracelet around so the light bulb faces you to remind you that you shine. That is very cool. Where can people get that because I know I know you do sell them and they, they are very inspiring and you brought a lot of them here to to Ed Camp New Jersey um, wh- where can people get that and also how can people continue the conversation with you where 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 are you online Twitter share how people can connect with you oh I would love to connect with people so igniteyourshine.com so I try to keep it simple for everybody igniteyourshine.com is where you can get the bracelet and learn a little bit more about um, me is in speaking and all those opportunities. I'm also on Twitter. I try to keep it very simple. Twitter is at Lavana Roth. So L A V O N N A R O T H. Uh, hashtag Ignite Your Shine, as we mentioned, is one all spelled out. And hashtag Shine Tastic because it's how are you Shine Tastic? How am I Shine Tastic? So that's another one of my words. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Again, everything's simple. It's my name. You know, Lavana is unique enough. So Lavana Roth on LinkedIn. And I'm also on Facebook as well. Although that one's a little more unique, but you should be able to find me pretty easily. So thank you. Lavana, thank you so much. I'm, I'm glad we are connected. And I was so excited to have you here on the podcast. And I can't thank you enough. So thank you so much for sharing everything that you shared today. Well, thank you, Chris. It's been such a pleasure to meet you. And I'm glad we had a chance to do this face to face instead of over the phone, online, all that good stuff. So thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And by the way, you're shantastic yourself. They're Superman. Thanks. And you made me speechless again. Thank you again to Lavana for taking time. She's a very busy person who is traveling and she had to leave Ed Camp before noon today to catch a flight to go back to Florida. As I've reflected on the conversation, now that I sit here recording this episode or this portion of the episode again, that was just one of the most powerful conversations that I've ever had with anybody. And I really hope that you can appreciate Lavana's story and also the information and the wealth of knowledge that she is. I know that I do. She's she's genuine. She's honest. I really recommend that you do connect with her on Twitter. Go to her website. Check out IgniteYourShine.com. There is something that you, as I said, you, you can use this easily when you go to class next time. So so thank you again to Lavana. And I, I'm still, 
I don't want to say shaken up, but you know, it, it was just a really powerful conversation that I, that I really appreciate that I got the opportunity to have. And now as we get here towards the end of the episode, let's meet this episode's House of Ed Tech VIP. And I need to insert an apology here as well, because part of this VIP was also originally recorded when I was speaking with Adam and AJ and we were attempting to kind of co-host the show together. So I actually had the VIP who I'm about to announce live right there. And that was really cool. This episode's House of Ed Tech VIP, sorry for dilly-dallying, is Mr. Ross Cooper at RossCoops31 on Twitter. And you can check out his website at RossCoops31.com. Ross Cooper is currently the supervisor of instructional practice at the K-12 school district of Salisbury Township, which is a one-to-one MacBook and iPad district. His passions lie in curriculum, unit design, inquiry-based learning, assessment, and grading, as well as professional development. Ross has previously spent part of his career as an elementary assistant principal, and before that, he taught for six years as a fourth grade teacher. He's a graduate of Muhlenberg College, and he graduated with a degree in Spanish and received a master's degree in special education from Lehigh University. During his time at Lehigh, he also received certifications in elementary education, special education, and middle-level English. In the summer of 2011, he became an Apple Distinguished Educator, and in the spring of 2012, he became a Google-certified teacher. When Ross isn't educating or going to school, he enjoys eating steak and pizza, exercising, reading books, and playing on his computer. He's an all-around good guy. Connect with him on Twitter. Again, his username is at RossCoops31, R-O-S-S-C-O-O-P-S, the number 31. And again, check out his website, RossCoops31.com. Congratulations, Ross. You are the House of Ed Tech VIP. And that's going to wrap it up for this episode of the House of Ed Tech. Again, I'm sorry this episode didn't turn out the way I wanted it to because I was really excited about that. So look forward to another episode in the future where I'm going to try and have a co-host and do something a little different and have a little little fun to create a different type of episode for you in the near future. For this content, again, talking to Lavana sharing a peer.in, learning about EdCamps. You can check out all the information and links for this episode over on chrisnessy.com and click the show notes for episode number 49. And I would love your thoughts on the information and resources that we talked about here today. Leave a comment on the show notes. You can also email the show, feedback at chrisnessy.com. And you can also submit your audio feedback by calling the listener feedback line at 732 903 Four eight six nine, and you can also send me audio on Voxer. My username is Mr. Nessie, M R N E S I, and that's also my Twitter name. Anything you tweet at me, just use the hashtag House of Ed Tech. If you enjoyed the podcast, and I know that you do, first and foremost, go tell somebody else about the show. That's the best way that you can help spread the word and help to grow the community and have an impact on the reach that I have using the podcast. I'd also appreciate a rating and a review of the podcast in iTunes. Your positive rating and honest review helps to keep the podcast front and center for others to discover and enjoy. And you can also support the show via patreon.com. Just go to patreon.com slash house of ed tech and you could donate anything you want. A dollar, five dollar, ten dollars, whatever you think this show is worth. On the next episode of the house of ed tech, I'm going to be sharing a conversation I had with Natalie Krayenvenger. You can look forward to episode number 50. This is exciting. Episode 50 is going to be released on December 6th, 2015. As always, thank you for listening. Thank you for being patient and understanding that I attempted to try something. But above all, remember, using technology isn't difficult. Sometimes it is, but you can still just give it a try.
House of Ed Tech is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. The Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators. Podcasts by educators. For more, go to edupodcastnetwork.com.